Hello yet again everybody. In this video we'll be taking a look at a couple of key post-production techniques that one should probably be aware of. Without any post-production, these are typically the kinds of images you get out of your renders. The highlights are overblown and they don't really have that nice soft roll-off we typically see on film or photo. The darker areas are rather harsh as well and the overall image just doesn't look that appealing and it has no color grading applied at all. So in this video, we'll show you how you can get from this to something more pleasant looking like the image you see in front of you right now. To do that, we'll focus our attention on the V-Ray VFB, which amongst other things it allows you to do, you can kind of think of as your post-production suite right inside V-Ray. All right, so first up, we'll start with tone mapping our image. That will take care of those highlights and shadows so that the image looks more natural. Now, there's multiple different ways on how you can tone map your image. Uh, you can use curves, etc., etc. But one of the easiest is to just simply add a filmic tone map layer to the stack. And then you can choose between the different types of tone mapping options that you have available here. They differ by look and also by the amount of control they give you. So if we, for example, select Ampas here, you can see Ampas has no control. And by the way, just in case you're into that ACES look, this mimics that. Okay. Uh, but as you can see, it doesn't give you any sort of control. Uh, then if you use, for example, or if you switch over to Hable, well, as you can see, you got a lot of controls uh, to play with here to get to the look you want. So different types, different looks and different controls. So what I'm going to opt for here myself is Hale and Dawson. So uh, I just personally kind of like this one for this particular image. Uh, you don't have to marry yourself to a specific type. Uh, but just kind of work what works best for you. And just maybe as a note, if you're searching for that Reinhardt mapping, so that a bit more non-filmic and a bit more old school mapping, switch to linear here and then you have your highlight burn here, which is basically a Reinhardt uh, sort of mapping, right? So just in case uh, you're interested in that specific look, you do have it here under linear, okay? But as said, I'm going to go with uh, Hale and Dawson here. I think that works best. Now, one thing that you're going to notice is that this image is a little bit dark. Now, we could go back into our camera settings and readjust the uh, exposure there. Or what we could also do is we could introduce an exposure layer uh, to the stack here. But one thing to note here is that if you're doing filmic tone mapping, do note that that will compress your image. So if you put exposure after the filmic tone map happens, uh, well, then the exposure is really not going to work as you need it to, right? Uh, but it, you, the way to solve that is to is for you to just to move the exposure to be first in the stack or below the filmic tone map where you have that full dynamic range of your image. Okay, and so this then makes the exposure layer work as you would expect it to. So now, as you can see, our image went from this untone mapped image, uh, where you know the highlights were all kind of odd and shadows were you know not that cool looking, uh, to something a bit more pleasant, right? And you've seen how easy it was to do that. Okay, so that super important step is now done. And next up, we'll focus on lens effects. Okay, so to enable the lens effects, just select the lens effect layer here and click on enable lens effects. And just like that, you have your lens effects. Now you can tweak this. You've got a lot of controls here. Um, they are really fun to tweak. Uh, so you can do lens scratches. And if you, if you just go to the bottom here, you can see the effect the lens scratches have on your aperture. So you have an aperture preview here and you can see how that affects the, uh, the actual lens effects themselves, right? So this is quite speedy. And in my case here, I'm just gonna, I think I'm gonna enable lens dust because it kind of makes uh, this bloom a little bit more spread out. I, you can tweak all of these settings if you want to, you can have a filter image obstacle etc etc there's a lot of fun to be had here um so we would definitely encourage you to play around in here another thing that i will turn on here however is the chromatic aberration uh just so we get these nice effects along the edges of where the bright image meets the darker which is a very realistic effect and you know if you're into realism you want this to 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 an extent in every image that you create right all right, okay, so the image is already looking pretty cool, uh, but we're not done yet because I think we could still color correct it a bit and introduce some sort of color grading on it. Okay, so color corrections work pretty much how you would expect them to. You add any of the color correction layers, so for example, hue and saturation, you add that into the stack. Now, if you play with the saturation, 
Well, guess what? You're going to be affecting the saturation in your image. You can uh, change the hue, etc., etc. And so you have a bunch of these kinds of layers. So you can do color balance as well. So if you want to make the shadows a little bit more red-ish, you can do that. And so that's generally how you would color correct pretty much any image inside the VFB. You bring in the layer you want and then you tweak it. Now, one thing that our users very much like is also the ability to add lookup tables into the mix. So we're going to select the lookup table layer here. I'm going to paste the link to my LUT file into the field here, and I'm going to switch this to work in sRGB. And now, as you can see, we're color grading our image with this specific LUT, right? Now, in case you aren't familiar with LUTs, uh, they are essentially these rather small .cube or .look or .3dl files uh, where you got your color corrections, color grades, contrast, and tonal changes uh, sort of baked in. And so when you apply a LUT, you apply all of those changes to your image using that single file. Now, typically in professional sort of high-end workflows, you develop a LUT specifically for your image or sometimes even a project as a whole. So you do all the color balance, curve adjustments, etc., etc., and then you bake that into a LUT and then you use that single LUT file on your images instead of recreating all of those changes, all those curves and all that by hand every single time. That said, in practice, you can also grab a LUT online. A lot of people are selling them and uh, apply those to your image. That then results in your image having a certain look that the original author of the LUT developed. Now, in practice, uh, this is a bit trickier in the sense that every LUT gets developed for a specific input. Um, so be it different cameras, different renders, different image files and all that. But even so, if you want to quickly transfer a color grade from someone else, then yeah, that's what a lot of people do. And broadly, it works just fine. You can sort of think of this workflow as um, filters on popular social media platforms. Now, one thing to note here is that you need to be aware of what in what sort of space each uh, LUT is designed to work in. So most of the LUTs that you get online, broadly speaking, I guess my impression is that they're designed to work in the sRGB sort of mode. Uh, but you do get LUTs that also work in log or in linear. And there's kind of no way of telling typically by the name because people just don't put that in there. Uh, but you do need to, you do want to make sure that you get this correctly. Otherwise, you might get a weird looking image. Okay. Now, Typically, also, once you introduce LUTs, you will probably want to go back and tweak the exposure a little bit, depending on the LUT that you're using. So in my case here, I'm just going to lower the exposure a little bit. And maybe what we could also do here is we could lower the contrast just a little bit. Obviously, these are subjective sort of um, creative decisions that I'm making here. You might not agree with them. Uh, but, you know, this is typically what happens when you start playing with LUTs. Main thing here is hopefully you can see how easy it is to achieve a certain look with the help of LUTs. And if you develop your own LUTs, uh, well then really you probably already know the power of LUTs in general. <laughs> Now, maybe just as a bit of a quick tip, uh, do make sure that save in image is toggled to on when you're in the LUT layer. Otherwise, the LUT layer is not going to get saved into your image when you're saving the image out. So do keep that in mind. All right, cool. So uh, now we, generally speaking, know the general color correction workflows in V-Ray for Blender. But one thing we still haven't explored is the masking ability that the VFB gives you. With it, you can confine pretty much all of the layers in the VFB to work on just specific parts of the image. Meaning you can, for example, color correct just parts of the image. Okay, so to get masking working, you need some sort of a mask pass. So in our case here, we're going to go into our view layers and we're going to enable the cryptomat uh, mask, okay, or crypt cryptomat mat. Uh, you can also alternatively, uh, just so you know, go um, and use the V-Ray node editor, be in world mode, and then you can add a crypto mat in this way as well, whichever way works better for you, uh, just so you know, right? This kind of, that's the same thing as, you know, the node editor. So once you have that set up, in our case here, we're going to be using a crypto mat. You could be using different options, but we're using going to use crypto mat because it's the most versatile. And now what you got to do is uh, you got to jump into your camera and start the interactive render. So not the viewport render, but interactive render. 
Okay, that's going to be a really important step. Otherwise, the masking options are not really going to work. So interactive rendering is what you want to do. And now, obviously, we need to wait for the render to start. Okay, so here we are. We kind of sped up the video or cut the video. <laughs> don't really know at this point, uh, just so you don't have to uh, wait for uh, the render to restart, right? Um, anyhow, now let's say, for example, we wanna let's say we want to adjust the hue of these leaves here on this plant. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna bring in a hue and saturation layer. And then I'm gonna click on this button right here, which is the mask button. So as you can see, you can do different kinds of masks. You can do a multi matte mask, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we opted for the crypto mat. And so we're gonna click on crypto mat, and now we're gonna click the select the picker here, and we're gonna simply pick the leaves. Now, if you want to see and if you want to make sure that what you've picked is indeed what you've picked, you can select this show preview when selected. And you can, as you can see, that's exactly what's happening here. You can also invert the mask, just so you know. But anyhow, we've now selected this uh, plant to be our mask. And now if we go back to our hue and saturation layer, we can now, for example, start messing with the hue. And as you can see, uh, let's just make this really funky. As you can see, it's only affecting the leaves. Right. And so as you can see with the crypto mat, this was really easy to set up. And this just, you know, opens up a lot of interesting sort of post-production color correction workflows for you because it's easy to mask things and it's easy to, you know, um, color correct things this way. So in my opinion, this is a really useful feature. All right, and with that, we're at the end of this tutorial. If you'd like to learn more about V-Ray for Blender and such, we do have a couple of videos on the topic, so feel free to check them out. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next one.